thank you all for joining us this evening. My name is Kathy Waller and I am a U of R graduate, class of 1980 and uh, 1983, the Simon School. I'm also a board member, uh, board of trustees member of the university. As you are aware, this speaker series was inspired by Jerry Gardner, U of R graduate classes of 1958 and 1965, and a life trustee for the college. Jerry recruited me and Carl Grant, class of 1990, and the current Atlanta Alumni Network leader to work with him on this series. Now, the three of us decided that we wanted to better understand systemic racism and how it not only manifests itself in our Atlanta community, but we wanted to learn more about the people and the organizations who work not only to eliminate systemic racism, but to address the impact that it has on the daily lives of so many of our friends and neighbors. For tonight's discussion, we will learn about the Community Foundation. We are joined by Frank Fernandez, President and CEO of the Community Foundation. Now, Frank will do a much better job telling you about himself and telling his story. But I wanted to tell you that he received his Bachelor of Arts degree in philosophy from Harvard University. He holds a Master's of Public Administration and Economic Development from the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin. And after getting his undergraduate degree, he took a little detour and spent time as a financial analyst at Salmon Smith Barney before he started down this road of public service and community development that led him to his current role leading the Community Foundation in August of 2020. Equally important as the great job he does leading the foundation is the person that he is. A very respected civic leader in Atlanta said that Frank is an excellent convener, facilitator, team leader, and he has the ability to move an agenda forward. He has great listening and reasoning abilities, as well as the gift to work with all types of people. And Frank himself stated that the pursuit of greater equity for all, for all has been his personal North Star for the past 20 years. The Community Foundation was thrilled to get a leader of his caliber, and we are thrilled to have him with us tonight. Frank will make a few remarks and then he, we will all move into Q&A. So I'm going to turn it over to Frank. Great, thank you, Kathy. Um, and, and thank you all for having me. So we, we can go ahead and just leave it here, Megan, for a bit. What I thought I would do is just tell you all a little bit about uh, my personal journey. Uh, and then after that, kind of dive into the Community Foundation and some of the things we're doing and the the topic we have here of how we're trying to how we trying to challenge and engage and address issues of racism and race uh, in our our home uh, here in Atlanta. Um, but to start, just to tell you a little bit about myself, I am a, a child of immigrants. Uh, my parents came here from Cuba as adults. Um, my mother was a, a slightly older. Uh, teenager. She was 17 years old and my father was a little older than that. He came um, actually um, after fighting uh, in the Cuban Revolution with Fidel Castro um, and then uh, left the island when Fidel uh, declared himself communist and then uh, ended up going back during the Bay of Pigs and was able to get out. Uh, and I share all that because uh, that, you know, for those of you are joining us who are immigrants, you know that, that those experiences of when and how you leave are, are pretty formative and they were definitely very formative for our household and uh, how I grew up and, and just our, my, kind of my own story. Uh, and so I was raised uh, in, in Miami, mostly lived outside the country for a while in Panama, but mostly in Miami, which for those who have been spent any time in Miami, they'll know that uh, Miami is in many ways like a, a different country uh, within the United States and continues to be in, in all kinds of interesting ways uh, to this day. Um, but as, as Kathy shared, I ended up going to school up, up in the north and that was a big adjustment for me. Um, but it was, a, it was a helpful one because it, it definitely set me down a particular path to where I am today in college, I studied philosophy and specifically was interested in, in ethics and political moral philosophy. And this idea that is still pretty foundational for me of, you know, what do we owe each other? Uh, and, and what does society owe us as individuals? Um, and what do, what do I think my role is in that, right? And, and really grappling with that both, both personally and professionally 
And, and for me, as, as she shared, my, my North Star has been uh, really focused on this issue of equity uh, for most of my professional career uh, and really starting with um, this idea of how you define equity. And for me, it really is about this, this fundamental premise that, you know, what can, what can I do? What can we do as a community to ensure that everyone, uh, every one of our fellow residents has a fair shot at a decent life? And what can I do to amplify and increase uh, individuals and families and communities access to opportunity? Uh, and, and so that really has been a, a driving force for me professionally and personally in terms of what I prioritize and what I spend my time doing. Uh, and so I won't bore you going through through my CV because I, I don't think that's really that interesting or important, but just to share that um, just my own professional journey, like my personal journey is it's not something I've planned. Uh, I will say it is just something that's kind of unfolded based on what I'm passionate about. And I, I am a big believer in, in that uh, that expression that if you work, uh, and do the things that you're passionate about, that you feel are, are your calling, you won't work a day in your, in your life. And, and that is definitely how I have felt uh, for the last 20 years as my career has focused more on working in communities and with communities and on these issues of equity and fairness. Uh, and so happy to be with you all this morning, this morning, this evening, <laughs> sorry, it's a long day. Um, so what I wanted to do now as we kind of dive in basically with that is just to share you share with you all a little bit about the Community Foundation, talk about our history, talk a little bit about what Community Foundations are and a little bit about what we do, and then talk about you know, the last year and a half and about how that has shaped us and then how that has shaped how we're thinking about how we move forward. So if you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So just to give you a high level sense, here's our mission, and which is beyond something we're looking to revamp because we're in the middle of our own strategic planning process uh, since I started 10 months ago. But it's still generally true in terms of we're here to, to lead and inspire philanthropy with a real focus on what can we do to help the well-being of our region. And, and I'll talk about how we're starting to reframe that. Um, but uh, we are part of a, uh, for those who may not be familiar, if you can go into the next slide, we're part of a broader movement uh, that started a little over 100 years ago uh, in terms of community foundations. So community foundations are different than other types of foundations in that uh, most of you may be familiar with like the large private foundations like the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundations or other smaller foundations that are family foundations like where I came from here in Atlanta, the Arthur and Blank Family Foundation. And those are private foundations that have private boards and they're, you know, they're uh, tied uh, often to either a living or a, a uh, deceased founder. Uh, and they have very specific requirements uh, about how much they have to give away every year. Uh, and they're, they're often tied to a, a very very narrow type of mission in terms of who they serve and what issues they focus on. We foundations, if you can go ahead and go to the next slide, really are in many ways or serve in many ways as our, our communities, uh, our, or, or the, the different communities they're in, uh, community endowment. They're really here as a connector between many donors and nonprofits in service of the community. And so, here you have some of the larger community foundations across the country. There are a little over 800 community foundations across the United States. Uh, and uh, they are give away uh, uh, in, via grants a little over six and a half billion dollars annually, just to give you a sense of the impact of community foundations across uh, the country. Our, our community foundation, give you some context, last year, uh, invested about $172 million uh, during COVID in a variety of different issue areas. Um, and so they, we as a community foundation here in Atlanta, as well as community foundations across the country play a really important role in both understanding what the big needs uh, in, in their respective communities are, 
but also in, and then partnering with others to address them. And so, you know, one of the things that that um, that I started to do when I first got here was really dig into understanding and reimagining what our role as a community foundation is in the, the broader Atlanta metro area. And, and one of the things that we really try to distill it to is understanding, okay, what are we uniquely situated to do? And, and what we've really arrived at is this idea that community foundation, that, and this particular community foundation is called to really bring donors, its donors together and other funding partners together, other private foundations, family foundations, as well as in many ways our public sector partners, bring folks together, to really grapple and address the most pressing challenges of our region. And so this slide here is, it is talk, tells you a little bit about what our, what I would argue is our, our most pressing is the most pressing issue that our region has been grappling with for decades, if not centuries, and will be grappling with for the foreseeable future, which is this issue of inequity. And so, uh, as you see here, we're number one, but it's not a good thing. And that's because it's really talking about both, we've ranked consistently number one for in terms of major American cities for income inequality and for having the lowest social uh, and economic mobility rates. And that is problematic. So you can go ahead into the next slide. And just to kind of crystallize it for you, this, this chart right, or this map right here shows you a lot of different data uh, that was developed by, um, so some of you may have heard of, of Raj Shetty from Harvard, who does a, a lot of work on uh, analyzing uh, income and wealth data and developed based on millions and millions of data points the, these maps that, that speak to what, what communities across the country do a better or worse job in terms of economic and social mobility. And as you can see here, uh, not surprisingly for those who follow this stuff, the South tends to do worse than the rest of the country. Uh, and, and that's part of the legacy of slavery, of Jim Crow, of just the, the way of the economic systems in, in the South have been set up you know, for, for more than a century. And to, to put a fine point on it, here in Atlanta, it's particularly bad. And, and you see here the, the little inset box that talks about a child born in the lowest quintile in Atlanta has less than a 5% chance of moving to the highest quintile. And what that really speaks to is just uh, the, the unfortunate reality that um, in some ways, uh, class and geography and race too often our destiny, because these things are so overlapping and so reinforcing, unfortunately, that you see, you, you get stats like this. So if, for example, for those who are, are familiar with uh, the different parts of Atlanta, if you were born in English Avenue, or if you were born in Thomasville Heights in the south of Atlanta, or what, you know, West Atlanta or South Atlanta, it is very unlikely that you would, you will kind of be able to have that, that kind of jump and, he, and even if you just being able to move even to the next quintile, it's very, very hard. Uh, and that is again, tied to location, to class and to race. And so for us, this data makes very clear one of our primary charges of what can we do to address issues of equity or inequity? Uh, and how do we think about it? And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in, in, in a second, but just wanted to, to, to share this because this really sets the stage for one of the thing, one of one of the central things that we as a foundation are really going to focus on addressing, and, and we believe that we as a community need to address. Go ahead, go ahead to the next slide. So here you 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 get hopefully uh, a picture of what's we've been grappling with for the last year and a half, right? And so. Um, in the year, in the year or two preceding you know, COVID hitting, you know the, that chart I showed you was something that was making the rounds uh, across Atlanta, among in the philanthropic and nonprofit world, and more and more folks were starting to think about, okay, what can we do individually and collectively to address it? And then, as we all know, COVID hit, uh, and we had to pivot. And one of the most most often used words uh, of 2020, and and pivot we did as an organization. You can go ahead to the next slide. 
Uh, and very quickly with our partners uh, at United Way, stood up a response to recovery fund, uh, and which was really focused on immediate, okay, what can we do? As many of you know, we don't have uh, a lot of, um, oops, thank, thank you, oh, there, there you go, just leave, you can leave it right there. Uh, we didn't have a really clear sense in the early, in the first few weeks and months of the pandemic of exactly what the need was, but we knew there was going to be a big need. And so we, we came together very quickly with our partners at United Way for Greater Atlanta to set up this fund and were, were able to, to raise $30 million, you know, relatively quickly to be immediately responsive to the pandemic. And, you know, this slide here is really just about demonstrating and bringing to life that by by ourselves our donors by ourselves or our other funding partners by ourselves we can we can do a, we can do a little bit and it can be impactful but together if we align around and leverage the full platform of resources we have and, and for us it's the, the community intelligence and knowledge we have about both what the big needs are and having our ear to ground to really understand how that changed over time, uh, as well as the nonprofit having relationships with the nonprofit partners across the region to understand who can then affect change and address those need those evolving rapidly evolving and fluid needs that we, we saw during the pandemic. And so that that, you know, this to me, and the response we had to COVID is a good example of what you can go ahead into the next slide. Um, yeah, keep going, of what we do best, right? Which is in many ways respond, as I said earlier, this vision of responding to the most pressing challenges of our region, of our time, that is something that we have done historically. And just to kind of walk you through a few of those examples, you know, COVID is the most recent one, uh, but we also did that when, uh, for some of you may recall, when the, uh, Dr. King's papers were at risk of being sold and leaving Atlanta we played an instrumental role in ensuring that they stayed here and they ultimately ended up at the Center for Civil and Human Rights, as well as at, um, at as part of the AUC collection um, at the Woodruff Library. And then also in standing up an AIDS fund and really putting a big spotlight on this issue in the 80s when many people were unwilling or fearful of doing so. And so for us, that uh, really speaks to part of what we think is, is critical to our DNA in terms of helping lead through difficult times and helping lead on those issues that are, are most pressing and most urgent uh, for our community and our region. You can go ahead to the next slide. So just to give you a sense of the, uh, and, and so this, this now has gone, I think a little bit above uh, 30 million, um, but the areas that we ended up giving to. And um, just to give you a high level sense, we've, we've done since uh, basically the last week of March of 2020 or first week of April of 2020 through today, uh, where we just closed out the fund, we ended up doing nine different rounds of funding. And why we ended up doing that it was because we knew that the needs were going to change and they were gonna be fluid and we had to be responsive to that. And so one of the things that I thought we did well was be able to really be nimble in terms of addressing that. So for example, during the first round, we made several large grants to really tackle some core issues around food security because we, we knew that was going to be a big issue around child care and getting care to uh, emer frontline emergency responders. And then over time, and, and some targeted money to help. And then over time, we started to really understand the needs of small business, of, of education, and how what we know now to be this COVID learning loss that's just pretty significant and we're going to be trying to address for years to come. How can we kind of stem? Uh, the, the bleeding that was happening from a learning loss perspective and invest in that, as well as helping to ensure that residents can stay in their homes. And so over you know, the series of these nine rounds, we really were able to pivot to address these different issues, to make sure that we're addressing different communities and their particular needs. Like for example, really on the rental assistance side and housing side, responding to the, the realities that a lot of the federal dollars for rental assistance were, were, was not being able to support uh, a lot of our Latinx residents. Um, and so how, how do we make sure that those folks are able to stay in their homes, provide them with targeted support where federal dollars could not go. And, and so really 
try and again be responsive to the moment and responsive to the needs in the community and working with our partners to make that happen. You can go ahead to the next slide. So um, here it, it gives you a sense of the, you know, what we see as the reality and then starting to shift to, okay, what are some of the, the, the things we knew before the pandemic? What are some of the things that the pandemic really just underscored? And then how does that informing how we move forward, right? Uh, and so uh, it's, you know, it's a little bit tongue in cheek, but you know, you have the American dream on the left side and then kind of what the reality is now. And, and as, as you saw from that map, place matters. Where you live matters in terms of really having an impact on your life chances and your, your ability to, to pursue a good life and pursue the life you want. It also underscores how that hard work sometimes isn't enough, right? It's a, you know, you definitely need to work hard, but by itself, that doesn't mean, at least for a lot of people, if you live in a particular neighborhood or you have particular skin pigmentation, it isn't always enough. And just, and, and, and looking at the data and showing that it's clear uh, and, and then thinking about what we can do to, re, to, to address that reality. And, you know, the one last phenomena that is something that is uh, hitting across the board, not just, you know, underserved communities, whether Black or Latinx, but also the broader, you know, white community and so on, is that for the first time in history, you are less, you know, our children are less likely to, to, to do as well as we are. And that has never, that has been the case in, a, in, in generations here in the United States. That is the case now. Like, for example, you, you may have heard the stats right before the pandemic that for the first time ever, the, the life expectancy in the U.S. went down. And so we're dealing with some serious systemic issues in our country that were already present during the pandemic and, and only got more acute once the pandemic hit. And now we're, we're trying to think through how we get out of that in terms of the pandemic. And so for us, you know, as we start to really, uh, as we're starting to get on the other side of the, the pandemic, you know, one of the things we're very, very keyed in on, especially as we move forward and turn this the page to the next chapter in the foundation story, is how do we not just, you know, get back to normal? We, we don't want to get back to normal because we know the normal isn't good uh, and isn't acceptable in many ways. How do, but how do we build uh, a better normal? How do we build a more inclusive and equitable recovery such that we can start addressing some of these things and some of the stats that were shared earlier? Uh, you can go ahead to the next slide. Uh, okay, Q and A. Um, so, the the what I want to share in terms of our our next steps is, is really give you a sense of you know being very direct how we're thinking and, and addressing issues of race, right? And, and how we're we're thinking and uh, addressing issues of of racial equity. So for us, uh, one of the things when I got hired ten months ago. I was asked to come in because I was going to focus on equity. That was our North Star. And they had made that decision actually prior to 2020. I would say that I don't think we as an organization, whether staff or board, fully appreciated what that meant, but there was a commitment to that. And so now, you know, since I've gotten here, we're working together to really animate that and bring that to life and understand for ourselves what that means to be focused on equity. And so for us, what that means is that we are focused on helping to ensure that every person in our region, every resident of our region has a fair shot at a decent life. That's at its core what it means. And that we need to look at all these different uh, key, indic key factors that really affect that. We have to look at race, we have to look at gender, we have to look at geography, class, LGBTQ status, all these things affect have an impact on either circumscribing access to opportunity or amplifying it. And then for us, we are starting and leading with race because we know, how, you know, data is very clear of the, the, the formative as well as determinative impact it has on either circumscribing or amplifying people's life choices and access to opportunity. And so that is, you know, something that we began in earnest when I started and have now really started to think through how that plays out um, and gets and gets brought to life 
uh, in our organization, both internally as well as externally. So for us, and, and something, you know, I, I push, and, and, and the, our organization is, is, is just another uh, kind of proxy for ourselves, right? Because to me, it is really about what, what work do we need to do internally so that we can do our external work better. And so for us, that has meant really taking stock of where we are and kind of holding our, a mirror up to ourselves with respect to um, both quantitative and qualitative the, over the years, what we've done from a, a looking at things from the, the, through the prism of race, right? In terms of our staff, uh, and in terms of, and, and for example, one of the things we did was a five-year look back at the at the organizations and its racial composition, and broken that out by department, by level in the organization, uh, by who has left the organization, whether voluntary or involuntary, and just looked at the data and, and kind of said, okay, what do, what does that say? And then asking our team about what it says because. You can't move forward on these issues if you don't know where you are and where you've been and acknowledge the what 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 harm that may have caused and has caused uh, for for different folks who have been part of the team. And so kind of this constructive, what I'll call racial reckoning uh, in terms of the DEI work we've been doing, so that then it sets up then so how do you move forward differently as a, as an organization, as an individual within your organization? Uh, and, in terms of our process, in terms of the skills we need to build to be more cognizant of the the, the role that, that race can play or the role that systemic racism can play within your organization, then how you then try to impact that more broadly outside your organization. And so for us, we're, we're on that learning journey. Uh, we're still in the middle of this and, and getting through all of it um, and, and learning a lot in that process. But uh, unfortunately, and this is, I think, something that's true for both our, our personal as well as professional lives. It, it, you can't put it all neat into a, a nice sequence thing where you can handle one thing at a time. You, you unfortunately end up having to engage on these issues on concurrent tracks uh, and not necessarily always in the order you want to. And so for us, we, that definitely holds true. We're, we're doing all this important internal work and kind of starting to get through it, but we also have to do the external work because we're a visible civic institution in Atlanta and we, we were called out uh, over a year ago by black art nonprofit groups because of the lack of diversity of the groups we funded uh, over the, the span of our, our arts funding. And, and it was a fair critique. So we couldn't tell them to wait till we were done with our internal work. We had to engage with them while we're doing the internal work as well and really think about how do we bring a, a, a lens that of, of racial equity to the work we do in addition to uh, an equity lens and all the other facets, but really focusing there because we know we have done a really poor job around that and starting to address that. So we do that for ours, but we've been doing that now for all our other grant making areas. Also in terms of just our board composition and, and how, how do we do a better job of ensuring that our board is truly reflective of the communities we serve. And so for us, what that meant when, uh, in the beginning of this year, we added seven new board members, five of whom were black, uh, because our board was not as racially diverse as our region. And so being taking concrete steps there, also taking concrete steps in terms of our staff and, and especially our leadership, because our staffing uh, or our staff is pretty racially diverse. But again, not surprising because this happens a lot of organization, it was not uh, so at the, at the top in terms of the executive team. And so you know, we've added two new members to our executive team in terms of one new role, one role that uh, we replace someone and in, in both instances we, we hired black women. Um, and so part of it for us has been very, being very intentional about that um, and not trying to hide the ball, uh, but also being um, transparent about why we're doing it and how, right? And so, as I said before, we're still early in this process and we'll continue to take steps along those lines in terms of our staff, in terms of our grant making, in terms of the vendors, investment managers we work with, in terms for us as a foundation that has a, uh, an asset base of 1.3 billion. We're gonna do all that. Um, and it is not, I will say it's not for the faint of heart because if you're gonna engage on these issues, 
um, there are people who are, are either don't support it and or don't, don't understand it um, and or feel sometimes we're just moving too fast. And so you, you and, and I'll just give the example, we have over 700 donors uh, and some of our donors are very supportive of the, the work we're doing and how we're trying to, to really lean into these issues of equity and specifically racial equity. And then we have others who are not and really don't understand it and are upset with us because they feel like we're, 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 going, we're going to an area we shouldn't uh, move into, that we shouldn't get into these issues. We should just focus on give, giving away money to causes and not go into this very politicized space. And so um, I've had to have multiple conversations now with lots of our donors on these issues to really talk them through why we feel like we, we have to and need to engage on these issues of race and why it's important as a, a civic institution that is viewed as a leader in this community that we uh, we have no choice from my perspective. Um, but the one of the things that's really important to me is that we, we have to lead, right? And we, we, we have a more imperative to lead and not but, but and we have to be very, very mindful and deliberate and thoughtful about how we do that, right? Because one of the things that uh, we talk about internally, we just amongst ourselves here on the, on the team, is that this the, these issues are very very sticky, and uh, in this hyper polarized moment in our country right now, people do not do not really um, seem to at least oh this is just my my own personal belief seem to engage with others enough who don't have the same worldview as them. And then oftentimes uh, will we'll not assume that someone who thinks differently than them, that they have good intent. And so one of the things that we've been very mindful of as we really try to uh, intentionally engage on issues of race is wanting to create a space both internally as well as externally where we're able to help bridge difference we're able to help create a, a common ground where people can engage on these on these topics, on issues of equity, and do so in a way that they they are, are willing to have constructive dialogue, and where we assume that everyone has good intent, and that way everyone's on this journey together, but they may be at different places. Uh, and so, part of what I feel we're called to do is to help call people into this conversation, not call them out. Right? Because I think that's the that that's a lot of the concern a lot of folks have around cancel culture, whether on the left or right, is that you're going to get called out. That is not what, what what we feel our role is. Our role is to call folks in, and, and try to find that common ground. Which is not to say that you necessarily agree, but you're willing to be at the same table and find uh, find where there is agreement and, and really work on that. Uh, and so. I'll, I'll tell you, this process is not for the faint of heart. Uh, and for those who follow the news, I think we're already starting to see a backlash uh, around these issues from folks who don't agree with them. Uh, and so for us, you know, this is part of why we've tried to be very intentional and thoughtful about how we go about it is that we're in this for the long term and we need to do this the right way. We need to be patient. We need to come with grace, um, and, but we need to be committed. Uh, and, and so that's that's what we're we're endeavoring and doing, I think, uh, now, and we'll continue to be doing for the foreseeable future. Um, so that's just a little bit about us. Um, the so I'm going to go ahead and stop there because uh, there's a few things that I'll, I can say later about how we engage uh, with the broader community, and would love to engage with you all. But I'm going to stop because I know Kathy has questions, and I've been talking too much. I do have lots of questions, uh, that's for sure. And you're right, not for the faint of heart. Um, and so I'm gonna actually kind of go back to Community Funds 101 for a minute, just to bring people up to speed. You say you have over 700 donors, right? And, and, um, and, and your visual that talked about collective giving and strategic it is fantastic. But those donors are people gave you their money. They set up these, what, donor advised funds, right? And they gave you their money to to um, give to other charitable to charitable organizations, correct? Yep. Okay. 
So your donors set up these funds. So what does it take to set up a fund? I mean, how much money do I have to give you to be a viable donor advised fund? So you know, one of the things that we're in the middle of redoing is we actually have a lot of different products that folks can use to, to support their charitable giving. Um, so donor advised fund is the most often used fund because it gives you maximum flexibility. Uh, and so in terms of when it makes financial sense for you all, for folks, it's typically folks who, who want to invest at least $100,000 uh, and, and start up a fund and you can use, and then you can you use your fund that way. And we provide, you know, part of what we, as part of the services we provide, we provide you with some tax planning support, estate planning support, if you want to engage your kids. A lot of time, most, most of our donors are older. They're, they're in that point in their careers and lives where they, they're starting to think about the next generation. They want to give back and they want to give back in a way that engages the, their kids or, or, or other family members. And so we provide support services for that. Um, and, and also just very, you know, a lot of times folks have what we'll call specialized assets, right? Uh, where it, it, it's not as easy to just give it to a nonprofit directly, right? Because sometimes you may just want to give to a nonprofit. If you know you want to give to, and you want to give to them every year, then I think then we're not the right place for you. You should definitely just give that. But for those who either don't know and want some support in thinking through their giving strategy, or they need support with the state plan, they have a more complex financial situation, those are the, the, the folks that we, we, we support because we do have donor advised funds. We have what we call field of interest funds, which are basically funds that are, are where you want to actually, you don't necessarily want to be in the weeds so much about what you give to, but you want to give to education or youth development in mm -hmm. the city of Atlanta or in Cobb County. And we can, we, you give us that directive, we can identify those groups, we'll, 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 we can grant those dollars out consistent with what you want it to, what your spending policy is. And we give you updates and engage you to the degree you want to. So we, so we try to provide different options for folks depending on kind of what their interests are, how engaged they want to be uh, and so on. So um, then you have a group of people who just say, okay, these types of things, give to those things, give my money to those things. And you have a group of people who, who that get more involved in the decisions? I mean, you talk to them before you give any of their money away? Yep. Uh, and, and then some, actually, that was right on the reason I was like a minute late to this call. I was on a call with our, our Spark Giving Circle, which are a group of donors who are actively engaged in Thomasville Heights. And they, you know, they talk to the nonprofits. We, we do meetings in the neighborhood. They, you know, they'll, they'll sometimes engage with, with neighborhood groups where you, where donors can really, they want to get, pro, you know, like uh, some of you may or may not be familiar with Brian Stevenson who runs the Equal Justice Initiative. Mm -hmm. He has this great expression, and you want to get proximate to the work. Our donors want to get proximate to the work. They want to understand the impact they're having. They want to understand the issues because uh, when you when you give to a nonprofit, you get a sense of that. But if you really want to get into it, you got to get even closer. And some folks want to do that. And then we, we create that opportunity. Uh, and so, so, so we really do try to provide a continuum of different types of ways to engage in giving back. Okay, so then you've got these group of donors that, and some of them agree with what the direction you're about to go in and some are more concerned, let's just say, mm -hmm. because they either don't understand it or they think you're going too fast or they, they, um, they just don't agree for whatever reason, Yeah. right? Um, uh, do people then change kind of their style to become go from a okay you just go invest because you know we don't want it to be that engaged to when you're going out a direction they don't like they, they they change and go okay wait a minute wait a minute we need to talk about what you do with my money kind of thing do they is that put part of this donor group so far uh, because especially most of our donors have donor advised funds they if they don't want to engage in issues, they don't have to, right? Because it, for us, we are, um, we are trying more and more to, uh, to get them to align because we think these issues are the most pressing challenges in our region. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're going to them and saying, these are the most pressing challenges in our region. We really want you to co-invest with us what we're doing with our discretionary dollars because we have a, you know, a significant portion of funds that we control and we invest in. And we were saying, here's an opportunity to co-invest with us and others, and, and your dollars will go farther because you can get great leverage. However, if these things aren't the things that you are passionate about, we're still going to continue to support your passions and help provide you with community intelligence and knowledge about 
nonprofits and issues that you care about. Mm -hmm. And so, so it's not an either or, it's a both and for us. It's just trying to get more and more of them to align with what uh, we're lifting up as the big issues of the day and the big issues for our region. So you all have funds outside of people's money that you've donated that you all also give to charities, et cetera. Because I remember when you did the United, when you and the United Way got together and, and to raise this $30 million, right? Um, and that was, it seemed like it was a separate um, kind of fundraising activity, right? Yep. Where, because I mean, I even participated in that um, as well. So you have those types of activities as well. Fantastic. Yes. Yep. And that, that's a great example of people rallied around this big challenge, including Coca-Cola, which I know you were with, was one of the big initial donors to that along with Woodruff, Blank and others. And then lots of our donors also came alongside. And to me, it's a good example of how when people come together, you really can maximize uh, leverage and impact. So, which is a, which is perfect to segue to what I'm trying, what I want to ask, which is, given um, you've got all of this collective power because of these, you know, you've got access to donors and their dollars, right? Um, you seem to be uniquely positioned to be able to make a huge impact. It, my words, right? And, and I think that's the direction you plan to be going in, right? So it seems like we all throw a lot of money at various problems, but we're not solving the problem, right? We are giving dollars and make, feeling good about it and helping some people, but we're not solving a problem. And so you seem to be in the position to solve a problem, right? A baseline problem. Yeah. I know you're going to go into that with and, and you know with grace and slowly etc. But 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 um, you know is there a way to I don't, I don't, move that needle, um, improve that point right? So set up a situation where you can prove the case to get other people to get more engaged in that because you seem uniquely positioned to be able to do that. So the, that is the the. The, the issue, that is the, the, the question and challenge that I think we as a community foundation and other community foundations grapple with. And, and the way I frame, I'll, I'll reframe what I heard from you because this is kind of like what I think we're, we're, we're dealing with or trying to work with is that um, so much of the, the work we do as foundations and our nonprofit partners do is about trying to redress the injustices uh, and the inequities of an unjust system. Right, so we're trying to help provide funding support for after-school programming for kids in schools that are just not doing right by them. Mm -hmm. We are providing funding for the support groups that cannot afford the housing in because they're not getting paid enough or the housing is too expensive, right? Mm -hmm. these, these systems we're addressing or we're, and we're reducing the inequity, which is good. So I think that's laudable and important. Right. But we're, but we're not reforming the system yet, right? right? And so part of it for us is you, and this is a constant play, do you address you know, the issues uh, as they're, the symptoms basically, as they're presenting themselves and try to you know, help folks alleviate and, and create opportunity for them? Or do you focus on the system and trying to you know, basically either uh, dismantle the unjust system and rebuild a new one or try to reform it or what have you? And my argument has always been, it's not an either or. You know, as a as a collective, you as an individual or in a group may decide I'm going to focus on systems or I'm going to focus on addressing the issues, right? So some folks are like, look, that system stuff's great, but that's going to take like 100 years. So I'm going to focus on getting folks fed. I'm going to focus on helping people get housed because I know that's going to help. Whereas this, I don't know, it may bear fruit 50 years from now or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. And in my particular belief is that you have to do both, and part of the exercise for us and, and what I'm really pushing our team as we evolve our model, as we really finalize our strategic plan is to really one, one thing I think we all got to do when we're in this space is uh, really what I, what I would say embrace the complexity is understand to the best degree we can how all this system works, right? So how systemic racism or, or the systemic issues implicit in our free market system in, in our democracy play out uh, uh, and, and grow through, throughout all of the society and then how it manifests itself in individuals' lives at a neighborhood or community level. Mm -hmm. We've got to understand that as best we can. 
and then understand, okay, what are we as an organization uniquely positioned to do? What's our differentiated value add? And so for us, you know, th this is kind of where we're heading as, as an organization, it's really looking at the interplay of both, right? And, and for, so we're looking to do some targeted deeper place-based work and select communities in the region, and then also doing some targeted systems work, again, in both area places, places where we feel like we can really kind of put our finger on the scale and move the needle in ways that we couldn't in other, in, in other issue areas. So for example, in on the system side, there are a couple of places that we think or believe we have the ability to have a differentiated impact. So one of those would be education. And I'm, gonna, and I'm bringing you into this conversation, Kathy, because you, I think you know where I'm going. We have several partners that we work with mm -hmm. that are playing an instrumental role of really trying to address the educational inequities we have in, in Atlanta and Atlanta Metro. Mm -hmm. Achieve Atlanta, uh, Redefine Ed, and Learn for Life. These are three organizations that are effectively supporting orgs of the Community Foundation. We have an intimate relationship with that we want to help support them and their work and lift them up because that's part of what our role is. Mm -hmm. So we feel that we're uniquely positioned to do that. We have the connection to them and we have some resources and influence. And mm -hmm. so that's what we want to do. And so, so for us, the way we, we try to get to the, your question is really understanding that and picking a few p core areas in addition to that, that we think we can really help move the needle. Okay, so, it's okay. The, so but part of the problem is, or, or is it, maybe I'm wrong in this. My assumption was part of the problem is that these, a, a lot of these agencies, and maybe not the three you, you said, but, but the agencies that deal with other parts of the problems of, of our neighbors, don't exist to do that and then and uh, or, or exist at least to support them right not really solve the problem but to support them and and to make lives better for them they but they're not really don't don't exist to solve the problem they don't exist to eliminate the problem so so to speak right and so are they going to be willing to because i think it takes all of them to work together to some extent to solve the problem so that's why I think you, because of your relationship, maybe I'm wrong, have that unique ability to bring them, to convince them to solve, help solve the problem. Yeah, no, I, I think that is the direction we're heading in because, you know, just to, um, you know, those groups as well as others are, are doing a lot of good work. Mm -hmm. But, you know, one of the things, for example, that we're very focused on now is how do we recommit and get our fellow philanthropic partners to engage with us with the public sector. So historically here in Atlanta, the philanthropy would, would support different things, but they do not engage with the public sector, not with the city, the county, they do their own thing, the city and county do their own thing. And a lot of that was because when they would engage the public sector, it immediately gets politicized. Mm -hmm. And if you dig a little bit deeper, it's really because they don't want it to be it's racialized and they're scared of being called racist. And they're like, All right, I'm out, I'm not gonna engage with folks because it's fraught with stuff. And so they don't. But the problem with that, we don't have the luxury, we never had the luxury, we don't have the luxury now for sure in a post pandemic world of not engaging. Because, and I'll use the thing I've been beating the drum on for the last six months is we have, as a function of American Rescue Plan, $10 billion coming into Metro Atlanta. And a lot of that is unrestricted. And as philanthropy, we have the ability, because we know it's a lot of money, but we know it comes with strings and there's certain things the public sector can and cannot do. They move too slowly sometimes. So how do we use our money to get ginormous leverage to unlock the full strategic potential of those dollars? That to me is part of the systems challenge that we have is that we don't collaborate well with public sector partners for those kinds of reasons. So that's one of the things that we're, we're keyed in on. The other one for me, it, it lately has been, as a function of doing that, because I've been meeting a lot with, you know, the COOs of cities and county executives, is even they, separate from philanthropy, do a bad job of collaborating, right? So we have in our Atlanta region, uh, over 100 mayors and like 23 counties. Mm -hmm. And that's just bananas to me, to be honest, is that we have all of these different jurisdictions. And again, the, the the kind of genesis of that is so tied into the racial history we have in cities, even, you know, the, I don't want to get political, but even the, the current secession movement with Buckhead, 
right. is all tied into these same kind of deep set issues that we need to address. Uh, but it speaks to like, if Buckhead separates, it's gonna create all kinds of issues. And it's not gonna make things better for them. It's definitely gonna make th things worse for Atlanta. It's only in really trying to work more cooperatively and as a true region that we're gonna be able to, to dig at more deeply these systemic issues. Hmm. Yeah, so I mean, the, so it, it, I guess it's, it's uh, the problem sounds even bigger the more you talk about it. <laughs> I mean, my simplistic way of thinking about it is, can't you just get people to work together? And yeah. Uh, yeah, that's not so easy to get people to just work together. Got it. But but it would be uh, a lot easier if there weren't people involved. <laughs> but ten billion dollars—that's a lot of money in this area that could have could have really gone a long way to solve some problems. Um, but anyway, so um, yeah, as as I'm kind of, I guess getting very close to needing to wrap up um, the. I wanted to ask again about the 4.5 percent, and and clarify that uh, point that you made because we've heard that from lots of people that right. you know a, a child born in poverty in Atlanta uh, in certain areas of Atlanta has less than a five percent chance of getting out of poverty. Yours, you way you stated it was they have less than five percent chance of getting into the highest court quartile too. So they you know um, they they certainly won't um get to where they are affluent but they could eke out of poverty for instance right um which is bad but is it as bad as we'd heard it before so is that my interpretation of what you're saying correct they can yes. get out of poverty i mean they can get incrementally out of poverty but they'll never get to affluence or a five percent yes. chance of getting to affluence. yeah getting to affluence. yes that, that's correct and if you go um because i can't remember and I, I could find it and I can send it to you because I don't remember off the top of my head. The, this Rod Strady project created its own organization and have a website and you can go to it because they actually have all this data and they break it down by quintile and they can, you can see it. But one, like, but one, one of the things that is interesting is to that point around generational shifts, right? And being able to get out of poverty. And it kind of speaks to, again, why this, you know, because a lot of these conversations around race and class kind of bubble up and, and, and people try to boil it down to it's just it's just about class and class without a doubt is a huge issue, but it is not the only issue and race still plays a very determinative role because when you look at the data they, they show there's a stickiness to when folks move up, both black and, and Latinx folks are much less likely to have stickiness to be staying or going better. They end up a lot more of them go back down in class a generation later than say for, for their white counterparts. Hmm. Uh, and so there, there's a lot of rich data there to mine. Unfortunately, none of it's like super optimistic in that regard. But again, it, it really just underscores how, um, you know, how, how tough these issues are to address and also that it is complicated. Because right. it isn't again just about it isn't just about race, but it isn't about class either, and it's about the intersection of all of these different proxies for advantage and disadvantage, and how do we collectively and individually think about how we try to address those those issues? So over the year that we've been doing this, we've talked to um, lots of organizations, and they've all had some um, desire to impact that statistic, right? That and, and and they're all working at it from their own way uh, in doing that. And it just seems like um, we there, there ought to be a def different way to address that that problem. But again, it's not easy. So I wish you uh, Godspeed in, in <laughs> your efforts to move the organization to actually solving those problems, um, coming up with the, with solutions for those problems. Um, yeah, I, I googled the word philanthropist, um, and I found this definition that I really like, and it said uh, a philanthropist is a person who donates time, money, experience, skills, or talent to help create a better world, right? Um, and it's uh, said that anyone can be a philanthropist regardless of status or net worth. And I, I think that's what we just have been talking about. We all can work towards this better world. Um, that you describe. So I would hope that all of us listening and all of us and, and part of the alumni, uh, U of our alumni uh, network will strive to be philanthropists and help to create this better world 
and um, certainly would love to help support you in creating this better world. What can we do for you? What can, how can we be of help as an alumni of the University of Rochester? No, I, I think you hit the nail on the head, Kathy. To me, it is, uh, and this, uh, I like this egalitarian definition of philanthropist. Everyone needs to be a philanthropist, number one. I think that's an easy thing that everyone can and should do. Uh, two, I think if we can be helpful uh, as a community foundation, helping you and, and your family in terms of how you want to give back and how you want to think about your legacy, how you want to th think about how you can have maximize impact, we're obviously happy to do that. We're here. This is this is what we're set up to do is to work with, with folks who want to give back uh, financially to to think through their their approach and their strategy. Um, so we're we're very easy to get a hold of. You just Google Community Foundation for Greater Atlanta. There's lots of ways to uh, track us down. Ah, thank you. Here here are several ways you can connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Insta uh, and LinkedIn. Uh, I use all of those social media things very often. Uh, I have, I think, 19 Instagram followers now. I'm very social media savvy. <laughs> um, so you can follow us on social media or uh, or go to our website uh, where you have you know my contact and other people's contact information to engage with us and get on that journey. So I appreciate you all uh, giving me the time to connect with you. Well, we thank you very much for your time tonight and for your insights. Uh, and actually, um, I've been talking with Duria, who you know, I think very well. And, and she and I actually, she mentioned your name to me because I, I wanted to have this conversation uh, and I wanted to see how we could be part of the solution. So you'll be hearing from me later, as a matter of fact. Um, so thank you all for joining us. And um, thank you for the incredible University of Rochester staff who make these events possible. Our next event, uh, currently scheduled for July 28th, and our speaker is Tina Fernandez. She is the executive director of Achieve Atlanta, and yes, she is Frank's wife. <laughs> so, um, so we hope to see you all on the uh, 28th. Frank, thank you again. I look forward to being in touch with you on, on this journey of yours, uh, and uh, we wish you Godspeed. So, thank you, night. Kathy. Appreciate it. Everyone, thank have a good night. You. Good night. <laughs>